Up next, we have lined up a panel of leading government officials, private sector representatives, academic scholars, and tech investors to discuss the future opportunities that lie with digitalization and the roadmap to outline a model that will attract FDI successfully. We have Mrs. Verena Wepper with us who will be moderating the panel. She's the head of the Communication Infrastructures and Services Policy Unit, Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation at OECD. She has more than a decade of experience working with the OECD on topics relating to the digital economy. She's currently responsible for OECD's work on connectivity and communication infrastructure policy and regulations. Her current projects focus on the communication infrastructure and markets trends, the security of communication networks, convergence, network neutrality, cloud computing, and ICTs for development. I would like to request Mrs. Verena to take over the discussion. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me welcome um, to our panel on investments in digitalization. Um, my name is Verena Weber. I'm working at the OECD, where I'm heading the Communications Infrastructure and Services Policy Unit. So we have a very distinguished panel from all over the world with us. So I'm really excited uh, and pleased to moderate the session. So we're talking about investments in digitalization. And I think we've all seen how the pandemic, uh, you know, just spurred um, the demand uh, for digital technologies, for connectivity, et cetera. So for example, um, at the OECD, we've seen um, that actually for the first time, um, fiber is now overpassing DSL connections. And uh, during the year of the pandemic, we actually added over 21 additional million broadband subscriptions. So um, it's pretty clear we have a soaring demand, uh, not only for connectivity, uh, for both fiber and mobile technologies, um, but also for the use of digital in basically every single part um, of our economies and our lives. Um, so the question is, um, how can we further spur investments in digital and what trends are we seeing there? Um, from a public policy perspective, uh, when we look at governments, uh, we see that a lot of the economic recovery packages at the moment do include um, improving uh, connectivity uh, in their packages. We have a lot of country that are assigning a lot of money uh, in improving uh, investments in connectivity and in digital in general. Um, so I'm very eager um, to discuss this question more uh, with our fellow panelists. And let me start with um, Pascalis. So Pascalis uh, is a managing director for BlackRock for the Middle East. And uh, what I would like to ask you is to give us a broader overview of digital technologies. So we have seen that those have attracted investments now for a while in both the public markets, uh, but also private ones. So can you tell us a bit about the growth in investments over the past years and whether we should expect this trend to continue? Thank you, Verena. Uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you today. So indeed, for, for a number of years now, uh, technology investments, starting with the public listed securities of, of IT firms, I guess, uh, have strongly outperformed the market and, and other sectors. The, the value of these firms has really multiplied by an order of magnitudes. Uh, taking as an example, the tech heavy NASDAQ index, uh, only five years ago or so, um, it was at 5,000, it's almost at 15,000 uh, right now. So, so we really see a very strong uh, growth. A couple of underlying trends that among other factors seem to be key drivers for this growth in valuations. First of all, there is a real explosion of data, processing power and digital users, but also of wireless connectivity and digital platforms. It's not about a personal computer as was the case back in the 2000s or so. It is now about the smartphones, the internet of things, the cloud, and we're always on creating new markets, interacting ways 
that are the foundation really of new size of the businesses. Secondly, investing in technology does not mean investing in the IT sector only anymore, because digital technologies are so pervasive and they're becoming enablers and key competitive differentiators across all sectors. We have plenty of artificial intelligence applications, real applications in agriculture, in healthcare, in the automobile industry with autonomous vehicles, in manufacturing through robotics. And finally, technology is also a key component in our effort to mitigate climate risk, the race to net zero and sustainability, which in itself has been identified as one of the most disruptive investment forces and has become a major investment theme. We're talking about digital applications in electrification, in electricity grids, uh, smart buildings, in monitoring, preventing deforestation, in helping us have more efficient farming practices, in smart buildings, in urban development. So in a nutshell, the outlook for investments in digital technologies would remain strong as long as one, they address big problems, two, they bring in competitive differentiation, three, they create efficiencies, and four, they become the foundations of new markets. Thank you very much. And you have described um, how different sectors of the economy like health or agriculture are using um, digital. So can I ask you about your sector? Um, so looking at digital text from a different angle, can you tell us how um, their use changes the way investment decisions are taken these days? I think it would be fair to say here that again, data and the processing power we have our, at our disposal are well on their way to transform the industry, to transform how both financial institutions, but also individuals invest. Uh, let me say, you know, a, a few examples. On the institutional side, uh, it wasn't too long ago when professional investors had access on a quarterly basis or in a periodic basis on, on macro releases and analyst calls uh, to, to get some financial data, understand market trends and uh, evaluate the security performance. These days, investment teams have real time access to financial as well as alternative data from consumer sentiment and purchasing behavior to value chain information in the industries they follow. These data are available for a wide range of sources and importantly, they can be aggregated and processed in very powerful ways to identify and analyze trends, but also support real-time decision-making. Importantly also, digital technologies are used to manage portfolios and, and risk. We're beyond the conventional factors such as divisions by industry sector, by region, or the split between emerging and advanced markets. Now we have literally hundreds of risk factors, including the ASG related ones that we take into account while we strive to build more robust portfolios and manage risk in line with intended outcomes. On the private sectors, on the private investor side, again, private investors today have access to data, to investment products and tools that could not be even conceived without the digital technologies. I'm going to name a couple only, ETFs or exchange traded funds, one of the most important digitally enabled innovations of strong relevance to individual savers. They provide diversification previously offered only to institutional participants at very low price for investors and robo-advising as well as other digital saving tools that empower retail investors and savers who might not otherwise have access to professional advice. So really exciting times for the application of digital on the investment process for both institutions and savers. Thank you very much, Pascalis. Um, this was uh, quite fascinating. So we got uh, the macroeconomic overview a bit from Pascalis. Uh, now let's dig deeper. And let's move um, to one area of the digital economy uh, without which um, the digital economy couldn't happen, which is connectivity. Um, so Zoran, you're the chief technology officer of uh, Ericsson for Middle East and Africa. So I'd be quite interested to learn a bit um, about um, how um, um, looking at investments in connectivity um, could you maybe give us like an overview um, of the investments you see 
in the telecom sector and in particular on 5G and how those translate basically to your equipments being installed all across the world. Yes, thank, thank you, Renana. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, uh, connectivity is fundamental for uh, um, digitalization. And particularly, I would say 5G connectivity. 5G is designed to, to support connectivity in industry. We are seeing a very good pace of 5G adoption global. Currently, we have um, above 170 commercial networks. And in our last Ericsson Mobility Report, we are comparing adoption of 5G compared to 4G. There's interesting findings. Um, if you look at the uh, number of 5G subscriptions, this year we are reaching half a billion subscriptions. Exactly end of the year will be 580 million subscriptions as per mobility report. So it's roughly two and a half years after first 5G launches. To forge for 4G, it took five years to reach the same, the same number. However, it's not the same speed globally. Some of the countries are leading, some of the regions are leading. And we should definitely highlight sitting here in, in Middle East that Gulf countries are one of the leading countries when it comes to 5G adoption. Um, some of the first 5G networks was launched here in, in Gulf countries. And we are doing this regularly check up what is the speed, what is performance. And in, with, uh, with the report in August, we are seeing that from six fastest network globally, three of those networks are from the, from the Gulf countries. Big reason for this is um, that governments recognize importance of 5G when it comes to industry digitalization and was supporting deployment of, of the 5G with the spectrum. So allocation of sufficient spectrum from the government that was the, the, the important pre-request to have this efficient 5G deployment. So it's a great job done here. Going back to your question on, on Ericsson equipment, we are truly a global company. Um, we are proud to highlight that we are first to have our 4G equip, 5G equipment installed on four, four continents. Currently, we are helping um, uh, our customers to operate 97 live network in 46 countries. Thank you very much for those insights. And uh, maybe as a follow-up question, um, where do you see further opportunities for 5G growth um, that are yet to be tapped on? Yes, um, Ericsson is study with our uh, partner ADL on 5G business potential, where we study revenue potential that 5G kitchen can generate in 10 industries. To mention some, it's manufacturing, healthcare, and utility, public safety, financial services, so on. In the study, that study found that uh, industry digitalization and investment in digitalization in this uh, 10 industry reached 1.5 trillion US dollars by 2030. The study is also showing that revenue related to digitalization opportunities will have compound annual growth rate of 12% from now until 2030. I mean, how this is important from industry is best seen if we compare expected uh, growth rate for consumer-related services, which is estimated below 1%, 0.75%. This is something which we've seen for, for a couple of years back. In this study, particularly industries which are seen as the uh, the main contributor for this growth, uh, healthcare manufacturing followed by energy and utilities. Apart from that, I want to highlight also one more aspect of importance of uh, investment in um, 5G and connectivity. Uh, and it is related to sustain sustainability and um, reaching uh, uh, this important target of net zero greenhouse emission by before 2050. In a report from Ericsson Research, it is presented that IC industry as a whole is responsible for 1.4 global, global carbon footprint emission. However, it is also showing that IC, ICT industry can impact up to 15% of uh, carbon footprint emission from other industries by 2030. And how it is impacting? It is impacting through digitalization. It is impacting through optimizing, automating these processes which we have in industries. And again, as we said, 5G is designed for, for uh, connectivity in the industry. So role in 5G is super important from that aspect also. Thank you very much. So we heard that basically um, the deployment of 5G um, is really important 
for a lot of different sectors um, in the economy, such as agriculture, health. But we also heard um, that investments uh, don't happen, let's say, equally across countries, uh, which is why I would like uh, to turn over to Diego. Uh, Diego is the former ICT Minister of Colombia and has basically um, put Colombia to the next level um, of the digital transformation a few years ago. Uh, he's consulting various governments across the globe. Um, so Diego, I would be quite interested to know, um, based on your experience as a former minister, what should countries do to attract more investment in digital? So for you, you know, what are the three uh, most important levers to do that? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here. I think Pascali said the key elements of uh, uh, where the money is going. But in terms of, of countries, I think the main key elements are three, talent, talent, and talent. And, and, and you, you can confirm that, and I, I guess perhaps Howard is going to talk about that. But, uh, you can see that in, 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 in IND's competitiveness report or talent report, uh, where talent is key today, and, and the same thing in the OECD reports. Uh, so we need three types of talent today to attract investment. The first one is having enough people with STEM skills and, and, and uh, coding capabilities. You know, in, in Latin America, we need more than 1.1 million coders now because there is jobs for them. The second type of talent we need is women, especially in the, in the tech industry. And this is not a gender equality issue. It is not a gender equality issue. It is, it is that we need massively people working in these areas. Uh, in, in the case of Latin America, for example, aging population is one of the challenges. So we need women that are not working today coming to the workforce. The, th the third type of talent we need is that we need to change the way we educate people so that every single professional ha has the skills to, under, to, to, to operate in this new economy. Doctors, lawyers, accountants, nurses, everybody. Everybody has to have those skills. And the fourth type of talent we need is leaders. Leaders that are able to create, to, to lead innovation, to lead the transformation organizations, or to lead the startup creation and growth. That's key. So for me, the element is talent, talent, and talent. And uh, he was actually not only a former minister, but when he's talking about talent, um, he's also um, consulting a lot of startup uh, and new tech firms. Uh, so let me tap your brain on this one. Um, so given you work uh, with these startups, which are basically the ones bringing innovation to the market, uh, what can countries do in particular to attract investment uh, in this area? You know, in terms of, of, of policies, uh, um, uh, you know, trying to have the, the neighbors are, are key, you know. Uh, and, and the main neighbor here is, is having people connected. Uh, in, in the case of Latin America, around 70% of people are already connected to internet. We still have to work on, on improving the quality of, of uh, that connectivity, but, but it is a huge market. Uh, the, the second element is, is, is to, to having the neighbors for the different ecosystems. And we've talked about different ecosystems already, but for example, FinTech. FinTech is growing dramatically. Why? Because countries are helping with the right regulations to, make, to let them grow. In, in, for, let, let, let me just give an example of my own country. You know, when we introduce the digital, uh, the digital financial inclusion law to the Congress, that was in, in 2015, the banking penetration in Colombia was just 38%. That law was approved by the Congress. Today, banking penetration is 82.5%, 38%. 
thanks to fintech, thanks, thanks to the innovation that bo came both from, from fintech companies and also from traditional banks that had to also innovate to compete. So, so the impact is huge, 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 huge. Why? Because the neighbors were there. You know, the, the right regulation, of course, again, talent is key. Tax structure is key. And you see, for example, a country like Uruguay today attracting a lot of money because they have a very good and clear tax, tax uh, uh, structure. For, for invest for investors, which is which is key, no matter what happens globally with you guys, the OECD pushing for these uh, global taxes and, and whatever, uh, uh, that, that that's also very 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 important. So so um, the the other element is make, making sure that 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 the, this innovation has uh, access to the markets. Uh, in the case of, of Latin America, access to the base of the pyramid is key, and, and that that's connectivity is also very 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 important. So because in, 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 so you have to to kind of use the current market, I mean your, your home market as a, as a lever to to make innovation grow. So and you see in, in Latin America, for example, it's, the investment is skyrocketing. This year, so far, so far, in the first semester of the year, uh, just in VC venture capital in Latin America has been more than 12 billion in, in hundreds of deals uh, in all kinds of uh, uh, ecosystems and, and in, in the most important countries. But uh, it, it, we are seeing a lot of investment. Why? Because many businesses are focusing in their own markets that are based on the pyramid market. So how you get with value, as Pascal is playing, with value to low income people. And that is happening massively in Latin America. And, and, and they are transforming supply chains. They are transforming uh, the different industries. So, so uh, th this, this also is an, a, a key element to attract investment. Thank you very much, Diego. And we have another innovation expert uh, with us. So Howard is the legal professor of management and innovation at uh, IMD Business School in Switzerland. And um, he is also the research director of IMD Center for Future Readiness. Um, so my question for you would be, um, so if we stay at this uh, topic of innovation, in which innovative areas of the digital economy do you see a growing interest uh, in particular by investors? Yeah, I think what is really fascinating about the um, current, the past, you know, as we rolling up the pandemic, what we're seeing is, as you said, is almost like an accelerator, right? Uh, where the infrastructure investment all the way to shift for consumer behavior, we see massive change that we couldn't have foreseen back in 2019. And as a result, I think digitization now these days becomes almost the backdrop of our global economy. And we've seen how capital shift across different sector. If organizations or company that are more ready for the future leveraging digitization, they see investors are much more open to invest in them. Compare and contrast to those companies, despite they talk about digitization, if they couldn't scale these capability, they lose the luster in a very big way. The gap is diverging. So, you know, you can see that in, you know, retail sector, right? Whether you are Nike or Lululemon, because they have invested so much time in building direct consumer relationship, whether it's embedded sensor to alternative business model, live streaming in China. During the pandemic, they see their share price continue to rise, compare and contrast to J. Crew that basically line up for bankruptcy. Not that J. Crew doesn't have a digital strategy. They do, but they couldn't scale. You're looking at auto sector. It's the same story. Those who can scale new capability on connected vehicle, on you know, EV, autonomous driving, not just Tesla, but others OEM, they see their share price continue to rise. Those who couldn't scale this capability with tangible result, then they see themselves becomes lackluster. 
So I would argue now these days digitization is almost like a hygiene factor to be successful. And capital are chasing companies that are demonstrable, demo demonstrate their ability to scale this capability onto new business model. And which is why we also see all these exciting startups going after IPO, including Allbirds and Wubi Parker, all these direct consumer brands. Thank you very much. And I think this panel just coined a new term around digital as the hygiene factor. Um, so maybe linking uh, your expertise with the one of Diego's who talked about talent, uh, what would you say, how can academia together with governments actually accelerate the digitalization agenda? Mm. So we see um, the key policy areas for policymakers to consider here. Right. I think this is really important because um, by now it becomes very clear that the financial market or the private sector, sometimes they do suffer the ability to invest in the long term, and which is very understandable, right? If you're talking about basic science, the basic engineering aspect, or even extreme capital intensive operation like semiconductor manufacturing, private sector have the tendency trying to avoid or they shun away from those because the payback becomes much less certain. And this is where the government must step in, in the sense that we are talking about geopolitics continue to be on the rise. The whole playbook about globalization is coming to an end. So nations do need to understand what kind of agenda we can move forward. Not everyone can pick sides. Some nations do need to play on both sides at the same time, uh, despite it's a much more complex world. So in that regard, I think the key here is, as our previous speaker said, is uh, you know attracting talent. But I would also add is around ease of doing business um, so that entrepreneur can really seize on opportunity locally. But it's also this notion of how do we leverage digital digitization to move away from the sort of traditional extraction economy into circular economy. Because circular economy always derives local jobs. <laughs> the digitization capability really change how the local community will interact. And the end result, the spillover effect, then the local community and the uh, country can really benefit from. So I think this is where a lot of the thinking across the world, local government policymakers are paying a lot of attention. How do we shift our nature of the economy so that the benefit would stay within the border, um, would benefit the local population, generating job rather than just exporting commodity globally? So these were really interesting areas for public policy. Let me maybe uh, just follow up on the area of um, talent and skills. Uh, so, you know, from your perspective from academia, uh, you know, how do you think you can prepare, you know, the talents best um, for our countries um, to have um, the digital permitting in all sectors of the economy? So what would need to be done? And I guess would need to be done fast. Yeah, so, so I think one, one key area in, in the discussion is we also uh, support policy and talent, talent management specifically. If we comes down to education, it turns out, you know, the kind of vocational training, despite we're in the digital world, is extraordinarily important. You know, the fact that, you know, countries after country, as the previous speaker already mentioned, the requirement of coders, right, software programmers. It doesn't take, you know, sophisticated software programmers having a PhD degree to have help derive benefit for the local economy. But you, what you need is a lot of vocational training. It's almost mechanical engineering back in the old days, but we need that type of infrastructure to provide access to education and critical skill set for the local economy to take off, whether it's software programming, or more importantly, as we are thinking about green economy, right? The retrofit of home and, you know, uh, solar panel. These are, we're talking about local job, but doesn't require the sort of, you know, traditional high cost university education. And I think this is where from the education sector, they could really build a vibrant talent pool that exactly fit where the leapfrog right now is required for the country. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, this is quite a task because it means, you know, very close relationships between academia and the different sectors um, of the economy to keep this vocational training going uh, and at a level that's needed for companies. Um, so we're staying at the topic of innovation. 
Uh, but uh, shifting slightly uh, to another area of innovations, uh, which are cryptocurrencies. Um, and we have um, David with us, who is uh, the Chief Investment Officer of uh, Monochrome Asset Management, uh, which I understand is focusing uh, on investments in digital currencies. Um, so uh, what kind of shifts in the digital investment market do actually investments in cryptocurrencies uh, provoke? Oh, hi, Verena. Thank you uh, again for inviting me onto the panel. Um, so the, if you take a step back and look at crypto assets, if you like, uh, in aggregate, like where did they come from? Uh, what was the sort of initial innovation? And uh, Bitcoin was basically a peer-to-peer -peer payments or cash payment. How do you, how do you transfer a cash payment? Uh, over the internet, and um, uh, you know that that kind of original idea has sparked a whole range of innovation. Obviously, you know you hear the term blockchain, but it sparked a whole range of in innovation in the payments in a payment sense. So, um, and and I always look at what it's inspired a lot of. You know, um, Diego mentioned uh, fintech, so it's it's inspired a lot of counter innovation, like in in the Australian context, uh, for example. So Bitcoin, one of the early promises was that it would be cheap and fast peer-to-peer -peer payments um, across regions, but so it sort of solves for a database problem where uh, generally payment rails would exist only within a, you know, a, 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 within a banking network, if you like. Um, in the Australian context, that actually inspired our major banks uh, to uh, sort of compete with that as an idea. And they've developed the National Payments Network, which basically uh, uh, is instantaneous payments. They sort of co-mingled their database of clients, if you like. Uh, and, and so now the Australian banking system has got instantaneous. Um, uh, it's still slow growing, but all those databases are kind of communicating. And the cost of transfer and the time of transfer of funds uh, has sped up Consider, <clears throat> excuse me, has sped up considerably. Um, and, and I guess, so how did Bitcoin or the Bitcoin network um, sort of counter innovate in the face of that? Well, they've looking at these second level, level payment um, solutions like the Lightning Network, which uh, you know, is instantaneous and very cheap. It doesn't have anywhere near the network effects that it would require to be able to roll it out globally uh, currently. But we're seeing, you know, in in El Salvador, for example, they've now uh, the the Lightning Network is up and live, and it's getting mass adoption within that small economy, of course. But uh, you know, it was all these different uh, nodes within the Lightning Network sort of spread around the world. Then that that enables very fast, very cheap peer-to-peer -peer payments for a lot of people in developing nations that would be unbanked or have trouble, you know, trouble accessing the traditional banking system. So that's a very simple uh, example of just the counter innovation that comes out of the di digital asset or um, crypto asset, crypto asset space. Uh, thank you for for that and it made a very nice link uh, to Diego on FinTech. Um, so what we're also seeing uh, that increasingly um, the big tech companies um, are investing in cryptocurrencies. Um, so what, what do you see as the main trends there? And you know, are only the big tech companies investing in cryptocurrencies? Are there other players investing? And you know, how, how this is gonna transform markets? Yeah, sure. So there, there's a there is a broad range of applications within the digital asset or, or, or crypto asset space. And now I've talked a little bit about the payment uh, the payment idea, which was obviously the origins of Bitcoin, which was the first digital asset in the current uh, framework that we see using the blockchain. Uh, but there's and there's lots of payments companies involved in that space. So. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's you know, PayPal and um, 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 I'm having a, oh, there's a whole range of large scale uh, institutional players now entering that space in the payment space. 
uh, MasterCard being a good example of engaging with uh, blockchain technology, uh, you know, to the same idea basically to um, not so much in that case to remove an intermediary, but to speed up and cheapen uh, the cost of payments. You know, if we look in the last 10 years, for example, the cost of remittances uh, globally have dropped from about 11% to 6%. A lot of those remittance uh, programs are still within the traditional finance uh, world, but they've kind of been driven, the, the cost or of all, of all of that has been driven by the, the crypto asset innovation. And then there's other sort of businesses like, uh, you know, NFTs or, and, and that largely started in the gaming world where basically, you know, you've got digitally sort of literate uh, kids effectively playing in these uh, uh, gaming worlds and, and, and not being able to retain any value for the stuff that they create. So now, you know, they can trade skins, they can trade um, there's some of the rewards that they earn in those gaming environments and uh, they're able to actually retain and transfer value using NFTs but also using tokenization. So you look in an example in the Philippines where uh, there's a there's a um, a, uh, a gaming platform called Axie Infinity which uh, people are playing to earn, uh, income and you know which is helping obviously a lot of people in that uh, developing uh, economy so there's a whole range of different uh, applications and there's uh, a, a lots of different institutional uh, and and uh, VC investment in a lot of these different applications and the last one would probably be decentralized finance or DeFi where where you're getting more institutional money coming into that space because it looks and smells a lot more like traditional finance, but it's just uh, interoperable and sort of disintermediated. That's the being the sort of major difference between traditional finance. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for this. So we not only have basically the big companies being active in the field, uh, we also do see uh, that smaller companies are coming in. We do see, you know, that this is um, attracting um, some sort of investment and certainly revenues uh, in emerging uh, economies. And you mentioned the Philippines. And so because you mentioned the Philippines, um, uh, Diego, I was interested if you have some insights, uh, you know, on what does that mean for emerging economies? If we think about the young people um, that are maybe not sitting in the capitals, um, but rather in rural and re remote areas. So you said, yeah, they need um, uh, more connectivity. Uh, what about their access to, to devices to participate uh, in the digital economy? Do you have any insights on that one? Of course, they, they need uh, all the tools to, to, um, to be successful in the new world. But what we are seeing, especially with the pandemic, is that talent before it was concentrated in main cities. Uh, but then with the pandemic, with good connectivity, people realize, hey, I can be like in the coffee area of Colombia, working from there. And then they move back to their original cities, you know, uh, 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 middle-sized cities. Uh, and, and, and now we have people with uh, experience going back to, to small places and, and things are happening. Uh, so uh, new startups are, are showing up in different areas. Uh, for example, in the ag tech world, uh, it is amazing what uh, it, it is happening in, in, in Latin America. It's like, uh, so people are, 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 are seeing a, a lot of opportunities because they, they said uh, it was boring to invest in, in, the, in agriculture uh, before, but now they get excited because they can, you know, mix the two worlds, the digital world and the, the traditional act. Uh, agricultural world so that's attracting also uh, young talent and that, that's that's uh, a, a very good thing that it is happening thank you very much Diego uh, and uh, given the few minutes that we have left um, I would like to wrap up the panel but first of all I would like to thank you all so much for participating in this panel uh, for getting up very early for staying up late um, this is really appreciated. Uh, I think we gained a lot of interesting insights. 
Um, so we saw that uh, investments in digital are happening across all sectors. Um, Zoran told us um, that uh, we see a lot of uh, investments going into 5G. Uh, this is something uh, we see at the OECD as well, where over 32 um, OECD countries now do have 5G commercial offers. Um, but we heard that this is much broader uh, and is hard term that basically uh, digital these days uh, for each company is a hygiene factor. And so if you have it, uh, you'll see investment flowing. Uh, if you don't, uh, well, uh, you need to do better. Um, David also showed us, uh, you know, how new areas uh, such as cryptocurrencies further shape investment in digital markets. And I think um, um, uh, together uh, with Pascalis, um, that we do have quite some homework to do uh, when it comes um, to the role of um, not only the private sector, but also the public sector and academia. So uh, we certainly need more connectivity uh, to make uh, the digital transformation happen uh, across uh, different economies of the world. Uh, we need a lot of talent. Uh, we do need vocational training. Um, so that we can pick up the opportunities that a digital transformation is providing. Um, all of this needs a conducive uh, institutional framework, uh, which means that you know, countries need uh, to get their tax regimes right. Uh, they need uh, to have um, proper FDI uh, rules. And uh, across the board, what was very clear in this panel is um, that we need to foster um, all aspects of innovation. With this, um, I would like to thank the panelists again. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much to your moderation and the panelists for joining us from different regions of the world and sharing such interesting facts with our audience.